tonight, I'd like to talk to you about how I touched the HIV, tuberculosis, and homeless epidemics. But more importantly, how they touched me. I had no idea these would be part of my life growing up in Portland, Oregon. Homelessness was a small problem on the West Burnside Skid Row. I had never heard about tuberculosis, and HIV was not yet discovered. I left Portland when I was 18, and my dream was to become a brain surgeon, even cure a brain disease. I worked hard in college and secured one of five full scholarships to pursue a medical degree and a PhD in neuroscience at Johns Hopkins Medical School. I was all set. Little did I know that East Baltimore would change all that. I drove up, to, drove into Baltimore in my 1979 Toyota Celica. And my first stop was the medical school housing office to look for a place to live. I went into the office, there was a bulletin board, I wrote down some names of potential landlords, I made a few phone calls, and then went back out to my car. Where are my keys? Oh, they're locked in the car. There was a man on the corner. He saw my predicament and he came over and said, I think I can help. He reached into his backpack, pulled out a Slim Jim, and went, tch, tch. door was open. I said, thank you. You just saved my bacon. He said, no problem, happy to help. Then he said, you seem like a nice guy. How would you like to come over to my house and smoke some crack? <laughs> I'd love to, but uh, I gotta go meet my landlord and, and I don't wanna be late. But I'm gonna be around the neighborhood for a few years and I'm sure we're running into each other Maybe next time. <laughs> the other thing happening in Baltimore, besides crack, was there was a new disease called HIV AIDS. We really didn't know much about how it made people sick, but what we did know is that a diagnosis with a positive test meant you had six months to live. I started testing gay men, injection drug users, and their female partners in a free clinic. I tested nine people negative before I met Paul. Paul was an 18-year-old gay man who came in because his friends said, you gotta get tested. You've been feeling sick. You don't look good. Paul came in and I said, don't worry. Everybody I test is HIV negative sat down, counseled him, drew his blood, and made an appointment to come back a week later. He came back, sat down. I opened up the book, and there I saw the words, H-I-V positive. I tried hard to explain what that meant to Paul. But I don't think he heard a single word. He was feeling worse, and so we brought him to Johns Hopkins Hospital, where he was admitted. I saw Paul every day for the next three weeks until he died of pneumocystis pneumonia. All of a sudden, being a brain surgeon, even curing a brain disease, didn't seem that important. 
I gave up my scholarship, dropped out of the PhD program to care for the Pauls of the world. The next epidemic I touched was homelessness, homelessness, homelessness and tuberculosis in North Harlem in New York City. I trained at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and right across the street was the Fort Washington Men's Shelter, the largest homeless shelter in the world. There was a new strain of tuberculosis in the shelter called multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. This first hit the news when 13 inmates and one prison guard at Rikers Island died of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. We had a medical student who was infected and went off to Denver, Colorado for experimental therapy. And then a colleague of mine, a physician at Harlem Hospital, was infected and died. I remember seeing a patient, John, when I was on the midnight to eight shift in the emergency room. It was a co really cold winter night. And John came in, he was unconscious with severe hypothermia after being on the street. I went to care for John, and the smell was overwhelming. I grabbed a surgical mask and grabbed it with menthol, which we had for this purpose, and put it on. And as I started to cut off John's pants, I saw layers of dead skin and encrusted feces. I was gagging, trying not to vomit. I was both grossed out, but also perplexed. Was John so mentally ill that he wouldn't take his pants off to defecate? Or was this a survival strategy to ward off potential assailants at night who would beat him up. Or possibly, this was just extra insulation to make his meager clothing a little bit warmer at night. We cleaned him up and warmed him up, and he started to come too. We got a chest x-ray, and it looked like he might have tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a hard diagnosis to make. It often takes days, sometimes weeks. But in seeing patient, tuberculosis patient after tuberculosis patient, I came up with a pretty good diagnostic test called the double portion sign. Tuberculosis in the 18th and 19th century was called the disease of consumption. Not only because it ate up your body, it took away your appetite. And John was skin and bones, and, and after five days in the hospital, I saw that he was asking his nurse for his second portion of breakfast. We knew we made the right diagnosis, had him on the right medications, and he was going to be fine. He got healthier and strong. And we discharged him after six weeks to the homeless shelter, hoping that he would make it across the street to the TB clinic to take his medications every day. Not long after I discharged John, I got my screening chest x-ray. And the radiologist called me in. He said, it doesn't look good. It was a long wait. Did I have tuberculosis? If I did, did I infect my wife? We were thinking of a family. Was she pregnant? 
would it be the drug sensitive kind or the drug resistant kind? If the drug resistant kind, would I go on experimental therapy and would I respond? The diagnosis came back. It was tuberculosis, but one of the drug sensitive kind in the Fort Washington homeless shelter. I took six months of therapy and I was cured. <coughs> Don't worry, it's just my allergies. You're fine. <laughs> my next stop was San Francisco, which was Mecca for learning how to study and treat HIV. Not long after arriving in San Francisco, new drugs were developed that turned HIV from a death sentence to a manageable chronic disease. Though not everyone was treated. Many thought if you give these miracle drugs to the homeless, the mentally ill, to drug users, they would miss their doses and the virus would keep on replicating develop mutations, and become highly drug-resistant, just like multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis. And that drug-resistant HIV could be transmitted to others. We started a program to learn how to best treat the homeless, drug users, the mentally ill, living with HIV. I remember one day, I was at the clinic, and I was on, it was Daddy Day, I was with my five-year-old daughter, Brooklyn. I had just finished interviewing a patient named Susan, who was also a sex worker and an injection drug user. I collected, I interviewed her, collected my information, and left to go make sure Everything was filled out, it was correct, and I had all the information I needed. And I turned around, and my daughter, Brooklyn, was sitting on her lap. Susan was admiring a bracelet that my daughter had made in kindergarten. And not just admiring the bracelet, but asking her about every single bead. Why the red bead? Tell me about the blue bead. That's a pretty bead. My daughter was beaming. Finally, someone gives me attention that I deserve. <laughs> it was then that I realized I misjudged Susan. She was not the node of transmission of the San Francisco HIV epidemic. She was a mom who loved and terribly missed her child, taken away by Child Protective Services. Eventually brought treatment rates in the homeless, mentally ill, and drug users from 9% up to 90%. The next epidemic was HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where 90% of people lived with HIV. Drug prices had come down, and treatment was economically viable. But not everyone received treatment because of the same concern. Would the poorest, the least educated in the world, be able to take their medications? If they missed their doses, would they develop drug-resistant virus, and would they spread that drug-resistant virus around the world? We started working at a university-based clinic in rural southwest Uganda. That HIV clinic had 5,000 patients. Not a one was being treated. Just wasn't right. We said, well, what happens if we raise enough money that we could commit at least one person to five years of treatment? We should try. And so we did. We went to the clinic and said, we have enough money that we can commit five years of treatment for one person. Who should it be? 
They picked this man, Elijah Luzanguzi. Elijah was dying of cryptococcal meningitis in the hospital. Before he was ill, he led a song and a dance troupe that would sing in the village about HIV prevention. They would sing about a woman who found out that she was HIV positive after attending her prenatal visit. And then she would go home to tell her husband that she was infected with the virus. And then her husband would beat her. Elijah would then sing to the village, who gave this woman HIV? Her husband. So why would he first give her HIV and then beat her for it? The clinic said, if we help Elijah, Elijah will help others. So we put him on treatment. After several weeks, he got out of bed, became strong. And then he led our treatment program and eventually put two, helped us put 2,000 people on treatment. Not only did he do that, but on, on the side, he helped 1,000 families learn how to build chicken coops to raise themselves out of poverty. The clinic was right. If we helped Elijah, Elijah would help others. We were impressed with not only how well Elijah did, but the first, the next dozen patients and the second dozen patients, dozen patients we put on treatment all did well. We published this in a medical journal. And then on Friday before Labor Day, or before Labor Day weekend in 2003, I got a call from a man named Donald McNeil from the New York Times. He said, I, I read your paper. Do you think it's really true? I said, yeah. <laughs> I think it is. And I explained why. Then on Monday, Labor Day weekend, I heard a th thump on the doorstep. And there was the New York Times. I opened it up. There on the front page, below the fold, left-hand side, it said, Africans outdo U.S. patients in following AIDS therapy. And now 18 million people are living with HIV on treatment in Africa with normal life expectancies. Now I return to Portland. At a time when there is neglected epidemics here at home, just like HIV was neglected in Baltimore, New York, San Francisco, and Africa. There are more deaths due to overdoses and deaths due to suicides than there are deaths due to road traffic accidents. A pregnant woman with two minimum wage jobs in a dangerous environment has such high levels of stress hormones that those stress hormones are rewiring her baby's brain that makes that child at risk for attention deficit disorder, depression, anxiety, which will make that child have a hard time in school, put them at risk for using substances, lessen the risk that they will, lessen the chance that they'll graduate from high school and become economically independent. And then, as I ride my bike from Southeast Portland to OHSU and PSU, I see an epidemic of homelessness that is no longer limited to the West Burnside area, but in every nearly every neighborhood in Portland. This is an epidemic that's partly related to drug use and mental illness. We need permanent supportive housing with case management to help link th these people to substance use treatment and mental health treatment. And with such interventions, most 
will do well. But there is a new type of homelessness here in Portland. The number of homeless people 55 and older has doubled in the last six years. These are baby boomers who had low wage jobs often in the service industry. They've worked their whole lives and then they get ill or their partner gets ill. They can't afford the rising housing and rental prices. I have a friend named Jim. Jim's been a roofer all his life. He loves the rainy season because it gives him so much work. He's worked so hard that his fingernails are almost gone because of the chemicals he uses every day. But he's been a roofer for 40 years. He's approaching 60. And he just can't climb up on the roofs like he used to. He has a home, he's not mentally ill, he's not addicted, he's worked hard his whole life, but he's one property tax payment away from becoming homeless. What will he do? So I talked to Jim and said, you got these two empty rooms, put it on Craigslist. He did. And he found a college student and a person who worked in a fast food restaurant who looked at the rooms and decided to rent the rooms for $450 a month. And that was enough to help Jim get by. Not only did Jim prevent, prevent from not become homeless, but he helped two people find affordable housing that were not that far away from becoming homeless themselves. This is an epidemic that we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Like HIV in the 1980s. But unlike HIV, this is an epidemic that's not caused by a virus transmitted through intimate contact. This is an epidemic that's caused by decades of ubiquitous economic forces. But if we can solve HIV around the globe, we can solve this problem here at home, one person at a time. I became dean of a school of public health so I could teach, give, I could provide 10,000 students the knowledge, the skills, and the experience to solve the impossible one person at a time. I am talking to my students now. I want you to study hard and go to class. But I also want you to go out in the world and find the impossible problem that you want to solve. Who will be your Paul? Who will be your John? Who will be your Susan? Who will be your Elijah? Who will be your Jim? Go out and find them. We are counting on you to solve the impossible one person at a time.